Whenever you and I face a challenge in life, we always respond in one of two ways, and that is either our way or God's way. Now, most of us know that doing things God's way is always best, but in spite of that, sometimes we don't always choose to do it that way. Somehow we have the idea that in spite of the fact that we know that God is absolutely omniscient and knows what is best, the fact that He has a will and a purpose and a plan for our life, that He loves us unconditionally, and He would only do what's best for us, we still choose to do things our way rather than God's way. Well, that's what I want to talk about in this message entitled, God's Way is the Best Way. And sometimes these wonderful principles of Scripture are best uh, declared by illustrating them in somebody's life. Some consequences go on for a lifetime. Some consequences are short-lived. But to do it our way instead of God's way is always unwise and, listen, there are always consequences, there's always a penalty. Depending upon the nature and the size of that decision or that action depends upon will determine what the consequence is and how long the consequence goes on. Always best to do it God's way. Now, forty years on the backside of the desert, he's over there shepherding sheep, and now, we are gonna do it God's way. So, I want you to think about something. Get your pencil ready now. Want you to think about something. What is the first prerequisite in doing anything God's way? The first prerequisite is this, and that is to have an encounter with God through His Son Jesus Christ whereby you confess your sins to Him and acknowledge that His death at Calvary made it possible for God the Father to place your sins upon Him. When He died, He died an atoning death, a sacrificial death, a substitutionary death. He died a death that made it possible for God the Father to accept you and me with our sins, forgiving us of our sins because Jesus Christ paid that sin debt in full at the cross. Thereby we become the sons and daughters of God. First, listen, first foremost prerequisite for walking in the ways of God, first prerequisite for doing things God's way is to have a personal relationship with God through His Son Jesus Christ and to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit who is the one who gives us direction as to what is God's way and how do we do it in God's power. Now, so with that in mind, let's think about what happens when you and I do things God's way. Well, number one, we act on divine command, not impulse. In other words, God, what would you have me to do? When we do things God's way, we are gonna ask Him, God, what would you have me to do? We are gonna do what God tells us to do. And this is why I've said over and over and over again how very important it is to learn how to listen to God. That's a basic lesson in the Christian life. If I don't know how to listen to Him, how will I know when He's spoken? How will I know when He's spoken? A second thing is this, he proceeded on God's timing and not his own. This was God's timing. God had it all worked out. Now, once in a while, you'll hear some theologian or some liberal say, well you know, the Red Sea experience, that was not a miracle of God. It just so happened that when they got down there, this wind began to blow and all these things happened and therefore that's how they marched across. Well, you know what, when I think about it, I think about poor soul. It doesn't make any difference whether the wind blew or God put a literal hand down there and held the water back. Isn't it strange that it happened perfectly on time? Perfectly on time. It was a miracle of God. The third thing is this, God will provide everything we need when we are doing it His way. He'll provide everything you and I need when we are doing it His way. What did He need? He needed somebody who could talk better than He could. And so, what did God do? He said, I'll send your brother with you. He'll do the talking, and you just do what I tell you to do. God, listen, it would be absolutely incompatible with the nature of God, the attributes of God, to ask you and me to do something that he did not provide everything we needed to get it done. And so, as we've said over and over again, that is, God takes full responsibility for the life fully committed to him. God is responsible for the consequences of our obedience. Fourth thing I want you to notice is this, that when we do it God's way, He banishes the fear in our life. Now, sometimes we may have a slight little trepidation about something if we are not, in other words, just our own, we know in our heart it's gonna work out. We know God's gonna do it, but because it's a new experience for us, we may have a little bit of fear, but the truth is, it's not real fear. It's just that little emotional stuff that runs through and back and forth, but God will banish the fear. And here's what happens. Remember this, when you take the first couple of steps in the will of God that seem to be challenging, you may feel some fear, but here's what you'll discover. Notice this, if you will. 
Next thing, God can accomplish more in a brief period of time than you and I can in a lifetime when we do it our way. Think about what happened. How long would it have taken Moses to liberate the nation of Israel, the Hebrew children? If he did it his way. If he'd have started a revolution, for example, among the Hebrews. First of all, they weren't skilled in warfare. They had no weapons. But let's just say they had a big revolution. So they all had a stick. And you've got javelins, swords, spears, shield. Charioteers, cut em up, just cut em asunder. Do it God's way, don't even have to have a sword. Do it God's way, don't even have to lift a hand. Do it God's way, watch God do it. Remember what we said. He assumes full responsibility when you and I surrender our life to Him. And so what we see happening here, we see God blessing them more than they could ever assume to be blessed. We see God doing it His way, accomplishing things that they would never have been able to accomplish. And what we see is this, when we do it God's way. God gets maximum honor and glory. Take no credit, no glory. When we do it God's way, He gets the credit and the glory for it. The scene at Jesus' crucifixion was so remarkable that even a hardened Roman centurion recognized that this was the Son of God. This realization meant that Jesus was innocent of the crime for which he was on the cross. The centurion must have had a mix of emotions. He had just realized that he had overseen the crucifixion of an innocent man. These were not the whispered words of a scared recruit or the trembling words of an easily manipulated conscript. They were the conclusions reached by a seasoned veteran, a man who had watched countless men suffer horrific ends and was responsible for leading them to death. This centurion was well aware of the strong condemnation of the Jewish religious leaders who put Jesus on the cross for blasphemy. His commander-in-chief Pontius Pilate had upheld Jesus' condemnation for making this claim. But he rejects the condemnation and declares Jesus' claim why. Because the arguments in favor of Christ were overwhelming. Although he undoubtedly had overseen many crucifixions, this execution was different. What did he see? Various scenes from the events of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion combined into a compelling statement. It might have been Jesus' response to the injustice. He was forced to endure at the hands of his own countrymen through arrest and trials. It could have been Jesus' response to the torture. He suffered at the hands of the centurion and his men one could think of the dignity with which Jesus responded to the lynch mob demanding his blood like a silent sheep before its slaughter. The scripture does not record any response from Jesus to the crowd's cries Mark chapter 15 verses 11 to 15 but the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate answered again then, What shall I do with the one you call? The king of the Jews they shouted back. Crucify him, but Pilate asks why. What evil has he done yet they shouted all the more. Crucify him so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus whipped, handed him over to his soldiers to be crucified. His concern was for their forgiveness, not for his escape. Jesus' mercy towards the people who rejected him and the soldiers who crucified him, including this centurion, his response. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Luke chapter 23, verses 34 to 39, Father. Forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his garments among themselves. And the people stood by watching. But even the rulers scoffed and mocked him, saying he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God. The chosen one, the soldiers, also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar cruelly, and saying sarcastically, If you are really the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. As they gambled for Jesus' belongings, Jesus' concern was for their forgiveness, not his escape. What a powerful statement.
Matthew chapter 27, verses 35 to 36, And when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then sitting down there, they began to keep watch over to him, to guard against any attempted rescue. If all this did not convince him, he saw something more the response of creation. Clearly the centurion was shocked to witness such a dramatic event during Christ's final hours. Especially since he had never seen anything like it before. It had an almost immeasurable impact on him. The centurion saw, heard, and felt all the events of Christ's crucifixion and death. As a result, he and his troops were greatly frightened. Even if the centurion and his group of soldiers had learned to deal with fear, now they were experiencing pure terror. It's this powerful cross and the love demonstrated there that moves hearts. Even the hardened, battle-weary heart of a career soldier. From death to life an old saying goes, The ground is always level at the foot of the cross. It was so in the first century and it is still today. The foot of the cross is where everyone poor and rich finds level ground to kneel and embrace the Christ who died for them. Truly this is the Son of God. We hear and believe the journey must not end there. We should have a passion to know Him more deeply. May that same desire burn in our hearts, so we can honestly know the One who loved us and gave Himself for us. One cannot help but wonder how the encounter with Jesus affected the lives of the soldiers. Did they become Christians? The pulpit commentary reports the tradition that the centurion's name was Longinus and that he became a devout follower of Jesus, preached the gospel, and died as a martyr. This is only tradition, we do not know if this happened, but we do know that truth has a way of clinging to a person's heart. The cross of Jesus has the power to change the individual. The centurion started as a Roman officer, overseeing a crucifixion, but ended the day, recognizing that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus has already taken the initiative in salvation. Christ died for you, now it's your turn. Jesus gave his life so that we could have ours back. He died as us so we could live as him. He not only pleased his father, but won us as a prize as humanity's substitute. Jesus suffered the withdrawal of communion from the father. Terrible as this was, it fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption. There are others who consider this a myth or at best. A theological story, these are all unique events that uniformly testify to God's unique acts. In human history, they are extraordinary. Supernatural testimonies that confirm the truth of the gospel and the transformative reality of Christ's love. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to the channel to update our best videos.